we are going through like a tough kind of period. This guy probably is not going to last beyond this year. But uh, in, a, in a meeting of like maybe 15 minutes, uh, I, I managed to, to, to persuade him or at least I used an analogy that I think it clicked with him. And I said, like, look, Libya has loads of billions outside of the country, uh, in, in the UK, in Europe, in America, and all of that. Most of these um, accounts are frozen. You can't access it. Uh, you can't really use it. Even if you want to fix a big issue in Libya, you, you can't have that uh, money to fix that issue. Um, so, like, what if you um, put less than 1% of the oil uh, that you sell, um, whether it's uh, on a monthly basis or a weekly basis or whatever, into a Bitcoin and you kind of like have that money because you're going to have the sovereignty, you're going to have like this amount of money that you're free to use, solving issues with electricity, with, with whatever like issues that the country is facing that you cannot fix with the money that you have abroad. And it actually clicked with him. He was like, wow, like, can I actually do that? Would I have that much control? said yeah well basically with bitcoin yes the other side has to accept it or somehow like you need to like convince the other side but there's many ways of they don't have to really get bitcoin on the other side they, you can pay them um uh, other ways but um it, you have sovereignty over your money and uh, you're free uh, without having a task permission from any other government to to, to use that money so um it worked uh he was interested he said like oh let, let, let's see how we can do a proposal about this. But I went home and I was like, with these ideas that like, I would continue, obviously. I'm going to continue and I'm going to like, I'm, I'm throwing some sort, sort of like bullet points into this like proposal. But at the same time, like uh, any any moment, uh, things could uh, go really bad in Libya and like war could start and this guy would no longer be there anymore. So it's just like, it's sad. But that that was my experience uh, in, into that kind of yeah, thing. like and and really um, think about it, Nasser. Wouldn't you rather have the Hashemites in uh, Libya? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Libya is a big mining uh, uh, place. Uh, we have uh, subsidized electricity, very very cheap oil or fuel that is basically generators that would be like actually cheaper than water uh, for fuel, and we we hold about like zero point six percent of the whole Bitcoin mining in the world. And in terms of numbers, Libya is the highest in, in the Arab nations and in, in, uh, in North Africa and all of the Gulf nations and all of these, Saudi Arabia and all of this stuff. So mining is huge. Uh, mining is there. Uh, there's a growing community. It's been growing for a, quite a long time. But uh, as we say, like whether they would like it or not, it's happening. So that's that that happened with the, without them like basically talking about it or without the government actually like helping through it but it actually grew and it's there so um you know here in jordan yeah. actually they don't have a mining industry um although it would work for them because they have in, over invested in a whole bunch of stupid energy uh, projects um they did a bunch of uh renewable bullshit uh, in the middle of nowhere that is uh, too expensive to connect to the grid they realized of course after they spent shit tons of money on it but they don't have mining. We're trying, a friend of mine is trying to talk to the electricity company to get one of their extra plants. Um, uh, I think it's shale. I think it's, it's some kind of uh, um, fossil fuel that they're using somewhere. Um, and they have extra yeah. capacity to, to mine it, but it's uh, not going much. But I'm trying to talk about that. To, I, I mentioned it in the orange pill to the crown prince, but I think... Um, yeah, I think you know the, the difference is really quite remarkable in the, in the in the fact that you know the Hashemites are going to be there for a while. Like it's it, it's it's very different from other uh, countries. Like there's there's an enormous amount of legitimacy around the king because ultimately uh, it's uh, he's the son of the king, of the prophet. He's the descendant, direct descendant of the prophet. So people uh, really. Um, find it hard to go against him, which is a good thing. It means he can plan long term. One one other quick story for you, sir. If I was chatting with a guy, I'm going to have him on the show um, tomorrow morning. I was put in touch with him. Uh, he's just escaped Canada himself. So originally Russian, moved to Canada, grew up in Canada, now escaped Canada and um, setting up in uh, Montenegro. And uh, they have a company called Bitcoin Reserves, which is going to uh, service high net worth individuals within um, the European uh, 
countries. Oh, yeah, so, I know him. You know? Yeah, Nick? Yeah, Have yeah. you met Nick? Yeah. He was telling me that – I can't pronounce his surname, mate. Like, don't ask me. Um, but he was telling me that since he moved to Montenegro, um, I'm sure he said it was the finance minister that he had met who told him – that uh, he had over ninety percent of his net worth in Bitcoin. So, oh, wow. yes. <laughs> so, like um, now, I'm thinking all we need now is these heads of states or uh, presidents or kings or whatever um, to start. That will happen, right? That I'm sure they're all going to have uh, Naib very, very closely um, monitoring his bloody chicken, um, monitoring what's going on in, in El Salvador. Um, and conversations are going to start at, at that high level, which is uh, amazing. This could all happen way quicker than uh, we were expecting. Yeah, there may be a critical mass thing, you know. I mean, a certain amount just has to happen organically. And then maybe it, there's a tipping point with certain people coming in, you know. I wish I could chuck in a similar anecdote at this point about having had conversations with the British Chancellor of the Exchequer. But, uh, I'm afraid <laughs> nothing to add there. <laughs> oh, come on. What, what are you doing over there? What's the point of having a UK delegate? <laughs> Seriously, mate. Are you and Neil? I mean, you've got to step this up. <laughs> I know, man. It's a complete failure, isn't it? Yeah. This new, uh, what is the uh, new health minister? He's basically, um, he's got nothing to do with health, which I don't know if it's a positive or a negative, but has he, I, I haven't really followed, but I heard somewhere that he's kind of anti-lockdown or something like that. Oh, I mean, no. I mean, it's in the same way that people, I mean, people used to say Boris Johnson was a libertarian and a closet libertarian that was just pretending to be mainstream to get elected. I mean, they're all exactly the same. And all of these people, this is the thing about British politics, that they don't, we don't really have a tradition of people having a background in the thing that they become minister of. It's basically just how close they are to the prime minister and how senior they are. So like one of the most senior positions is like home secretary and so the fourth most senior person who just become home secretary. It's, it, there's very little to do with, oh, this person's worked in health. This person's yeah, I mean, worked it's in not like competence matters in these businesses. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite comical sometimes. Um, I just, they'll announce it. There'll be a cabinet reshuffle and they'll be like, oh, yeah, this guy that's on transport is now on education. And then he'll just sort of come out and give this statement saying, yes, I'm just really looking forward to giving uh, to doing all of these random things with education. Like, dude, you, you, you just found out about this five minutes ago. You already decided what your new policies are. It's kind of comical to watch. Yeah, it's comical everywhere. I don't know, man. The world is just becoming one big sick prison. There's nowhere to go. So if you're going to record this, you got anything in mind? No, not really. I think I think the new Fed is fucking genius. <laughs> I, and like, uh, oh, yeah? what was your wait? I think it's going under. I think it's going misunderstood. Mm. You mean how people are taking what it, people are taking it to mean? New Fed. Like what, the, what do you mean? The, the, this meeting the, the, is being recorded. All right. Uh, the um, yeah, it looks like you're recording. So, the, <laughs> the 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 whole difficulty adjustment kind of epiphany that uh, was like the the new Fed meme that 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 Safe put on it, uh, and I know just just think just just watching like the what was it? It was settled at like minus twenty seven percent or something. Then the next day, twenty eight percent. Then the next day the estimated difficulty adjustment was like minus 41. And all of a sudden, it, it just clicked. I was having a coffee in a cafe, and it just clicked. It's like, holy shit. Wall Street are going to start building derivatives around the difficulty adjustment. This is, this is it. Like, this, this is where, like, Bitcoin, the financialization of Bitcoin begins. 
and the difficulty adjustment is the metric. And so I put that on a group and safe was all over straight away, hashtag new fed. And when, if you think about it, like it's fucking perfect. There's, that's the new fed. That's the new, like, instead of like releasing interest rates or whatever, once a month or once every other month, or whenever the fuck they feel like it, it's written in stone. We once know once every two weeks. Once every two weeks, once every however many blocks, um, we have the uh, the estimated date. We have this estimated percentage change, which is going to fluctuate day to day, which markets can be made around and have final settlement on, and no argument over like you know what once once that is done, that is done. Everything gets settled. All the derivatives get settled around it. This is the the financialization of Bitcoin and. Everything else just like trickles down from that, and it just started blowing my mind. And then, yeah, safe throughout the, the hashtag new fed meme on the group. And it, we don't have to read through minutes anymore. Like, what's the fucking point? It's there, it's all there in front of your eyes, and no one's controlling it. Anyone can look it up. And the interesting thing about it is that it's you can think of the difficulty as being the one numerical summary of the real world that Bitcoin takes. You know, Bitcoin has one input from the real world other than the transactions, you know, all of the mining and all of the economics of it and all the market of it. There's only one input and it's just how much hash rate we throw in. And it takes all of that and every two weeks it looks at it and it gives it an estimate and it says, yep, you know, this is this number, this is how much, this is how tough you guys are. This is how hard you tried to mine Bitcoin. This is how much you want Bitcoin. All right, <laughs> I'm going to give it to you that hard. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it has no idea what's going on out there in terms of people buying and selling, people investing in mining, people banning mining in their countries, people transferring their miners halfway around the world. All of that's going on, but, you know, it has no way of telling except through the um, hash rate. So it just has the hash rate um, uh, to estimate how much people are trying to mine this thing. And that gives it effectively, you know, th that's the way in which Bitcoin understands its own market value. You know, people are mining so hard right now that uh, these uh, six and a quarter coins plus transaction fees that we're giving out I'm, I'm speaking in the name of, uh, I'm sort of doing the internal monologue of the Bitcoin network here. So humor me for a minute, but we're giving out six and a quarter Bitcoin and this is how much people want them. This is how hard people are working for them. This is roughly how much they can um, expend on them in terms of resources. And so it's amazing that you think about it. This really summarizes everything that takes place in the world market for Bitcoin, like everything, all the buying, all the selling, it all boils down to this. It, it determines how much people are mining and it determines how much hash rate there is. And therefore it determines the difficulty. And so the difficulty is always adjustment to keep, to keep the output constant, regardless of what is going on in the world. We're making one block roughly every 10 minutes and we're giving out this many Bitcoins according to schedule. And that's it. And it's amazing because it's, what's astonishing about it is that this could work as a game between 10 people and it could work as a global monetary system. It doesn't matter. It's just, it all, we just raise the difficulty of the math problems. There's just so many numbers out there for us to tap into that we can just keep making it harder and harder and the system can continue to scale. That's really like, that's the limitation on Bitcoin scaling effectively is just um, finding a limit to numbers. You know, if we get to a point where we find all the numbers that are out there and then we can't raise the difficulty anymore, then yeah, I guess Bitcoin stops scaling. But I'm pretty sure we still haven't uh, found a limit to numbers. <laughs> There's no highest number in the world. So it can just continue to grow infinitely because the difficulty continues to rise no matter how much economic value comes on the network. It's amazing. And it's all based on truth, right? Right, right. Like you said, like the, the hash rate, it can never lie. That's all it knows. I mean, we can have as much conjecture around it 
in the world as we like. We can have, um, you know, miners hedging, like, like you're saying, you know, people are moving miners, you know, from China to the US or wherever else they're, they're locating to. Uh, and this is, a, you know, a costly operation. But if there was like a really good derivative market based around the difficulty adjustment, they could uh, have um, very highly uh, skilled um, traders, financiers or um, consultants helping them make decisions on what they're going to do. The whole market blows up. You've got speculators and traders wherever, whether it's on uh, in hedge funds or in um, you know Main Street banks or you know Wall Street. It doesn't matter. They can conject as much as they like, and they can argue about it's going up, it's going down. But ultimately, when it comes to that final block of that epoch, that's it. It's settled. Move on, guys. You got another two weeks. Go start the whole thing again. There's no minutes. There's no, he was wearing a red tie when he walked in. There's no, what color suit was he wearing? <laughs> it's, it's pure. And it's blowing my fucking mind, Safe. It's, it's like, it's, it's, it, it's amazing. It really is. And I think it's, uh, it's naturally going to develop. I'm not so sure about the state of the market um, in this regard, but I think it's inevitable that it's going to develop as a way for miners to invest um, and for Bitcoin, uh, for entities that hold Bitcoin and want to hedge in certain ways, I think there's definitely going to be a role for it, particularly for miners. Um, it's almost inevitable that this is going to happen. And if you think about it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be a good measure of uh, how the network is growing for a very long time along with the price because it's going to be highly correlated and related to the price. It's uh, it's it's quite amazing, yeah. You know, another thing, branching off of this for just a moment, I was just thinking as as Dan, you were talking, how the you know we talk about Austrian economics, libertarian economics being uh, based on subjective value, right? That value is a subjective thing, but we have our money is is actually really subjective. So what they're trying to impose, right, is a situation where value is 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 imposed from top down, right? This whole Marxist thing that they've got going on. But the money itself is really subjective, right? And what we really want is the opposite, where our value is recognized for its subjectivity, that that's, that's a really valid thing, but the money itself is not subjective. You know, I'm not sure that's the right word for it, but um, to say that Bitcoin is not subjective but do you know what I'm trying to say? That it, but that it can't be manipulated. Yeah, it doesn't care. It's um, it's it's amazing. It's just economic truth. You know, it's um, it's free markets, and anyone can do whatever they want, and anyone can affect this in any way that they want. You know, uh, you can make these numbers go up by buying yourself and by mining yourself. Or you can ignore them and you can take, uh, or you can, you know, short them. Um, but talk doesn't cut it. And that's the amazing thing about it. It's, it, it's amazing that it's just a machine. And over time, <laughs> people who have opinions about monetary policy are going to start looking like people who talk to their uh, cars and talk to their machinery. Um, just expecting their machinery to do things that they're absolutely not uh, set up to do, like talking to the washing machine and trying to have a conversation with it. And, you know, how do you feel today? Do you want to wash today? Do you think we can do two loads today? Or do you think you had enough because we did two yesterday? What do you think? This is what it's going to look like if you're still thinking that you have an opinion on monetary policy. If you have an opinion on the washing machine, you know, you go, you press the right buttons and you get the right laundry done and that's how it works there's no emotions there there's no talking you just do what the machine requires and it's done and that's uh, yeah it's going to be amazing watching humanity learn to um, <laughs> accept monetary policy as a new machine that you just learn how to deal with it's going to uh, the um the other day at the end of the seminar with Patrick Moore, you, you did a great job of leading him right into 
to be curious about Bitcoin. That, that was really good. But when he looks at it and sees this phenomena, he's going to recognize it. it it's going to impact. I think so. I hope so. I think I've also come to this conclusion, like talking to people who um, come at Bitcoin from the perspective of, well, you know, nobody's going to want to learn all of this complicated bullshit about uh, private keys and public keys. And I think the best way that I've managed to communicate this to them is, again, the issue of the machine. Like it's, you know, at some point learning how to work an oven was stupid and complicated. And the same was true for a washing machine and the same was true for a car. You know, it involves all kinds of weird things. You have to um, pour liquids down it, the car and then press things with your hand and put a key somewhere and then um, step on things. You know, who's got time to learn all of these uh <laughs> all of these complicated rituals, you know? But eventually you realize that uh, the alternative is you spend a lot of time walking and waste a lot of your time in uh, walking, or you realize you spend a lot of your time washing with your own hands, or you have a lot of dirty clothes. Um, and you realize, no, figuring out how to work those buttons is, um, a better option. And that's why everybody eventually learns to read and write and do, well, not everybody, but you know, a lot of people do read and write and do math and figure out how to run a washing machine, figure out how to drive. Effectively, it is a better way of uh, living your life because it allows you to economize much more. You know, these machines, all of these machines, they allow you to trade off your time um, to trade off your uh, money for time. You know, you buy the washing machine once and it gives you uh, 10 years of uh, free laundry time. You know, the time you would have been using for doing laundry is now gone and you're left with um, uh, free time in which you can, you know, read books or uh, develop relationships with your friends or family or do all kinds of things that many people could not afford to do because they had to wash with their own hands and they had to collect firewood with their own hands. That's what machines do. They save us time and they get things done. And Bitcoin is an enormous global machine distributed all over the world. Think of it as one big giant washing machine for, uh, or one big giant plumbing really is what it is. It's it's plumbing. It's, it's one big giant plumbing structure for money and for economic value. And it's uh, one big plumbing system that exists all over the world for moving value around. And um, you may not like the uh, rituals, but over time you're going to realize that these rituals involved with using Bitcoin um, uh, for, you know, um, private keys and public keys, all of that stuff and addresses, um, you know, <laughs> it's going to be easier than dealing with the consequences of manual monetary policy. Just like whatever complications the washing machine involves, it's still much better than dealing with having to wash with your own hands. It just wins. Most people who have the option, the vast majority of people who have the option between washing their clothes with their hands and washing their clothes with their washing machine, choose the washing machine and um, a higher productivity does that. And I think people need to start thinking about it this way. Uh, and, I, and this is one of the things that I really like about Michael Saylor's um, glorious entry into the Bitcoin world is that it really reframed the discussion in engineering terms, which is really helpful because frankly, even I <laughs> get a little... Uh, think that we could take it a little bit overboard with the political uh, focus on the thing, on, on the political and economic and social implications of Bitcoin, that there's a very powerful engineering case out there for explaining Bitcoin as a monetary system, which I, I kind of do in, in the Bitcoin standard, but I think Michael Sera does an, an, um, an incredibly more powerful job in, ex, in, in explaining it in that sense, is it's just a much more advanced machine than all of the bullshit that we have. We have tried all the other things. Gold is very expensive to move around. Government money is inflationary. Bitcoin is not inflationary and it's very cheap to move around. And 
you can yell, you can shout, you can cry, you can cry harder, you can cry much harder. You can't change that very real reality. Um, you know, you can refuse to believe it. You can refuse to think about it. You can stomp your feet like a child and say, I don't want to play this game. But it won't change the reality. You know, if you're going to put your money in government money and if you're going to play government money games, you're going to be burned with government money prizes. And there's no prizes for guessing what those prizes are. It's very well known. You get into government money, you're going to get significant reduction in the value. And your businesses need to continuously outperform a very high threshold, very high hurdle rate in order for you to be making good returns. And if you have gold, you're paying enormous amounts of transaction fees and you're still not keeping up with inflation in real terms. You're, you're not even keeping up with the prices of lumber and most agricultural and commercial and industrial goods. Well, industrial, you probably, gold does better than most industrial goods, I think. Well, it depends on what time frame, but it's not doing very well. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is protected from inflation and you can move it around. And it has enormous upside growth in liquidity. So as a machine for storing and moving value into the future and into space across the world, it's quite literally unmatched. And uh, people just need to start accepting it and understanding it. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's sad that, you know, for the world's midwits, for the world's... Um, for the people who take their understanding of the world in terms of just looking at how others behave, you know, this basically, uh, I think a majority of people think like that. They, they don't want to work themselves too hard in thinking about what's actually going on. And so they just look at the people around them and they take cues and, you know, they see somebody who looks like they know what they're doing and they just think, all right, let's just listen to that guy. And, it's sad because those people, <laughs> like, they can't get past finding fault in Bitcoin and Bitcoiners and their own personal problems with Bitcoin and Bitcoiners enough to just understand that it's a machine that doesn't give a shit about you and what you think. And um, it, 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 you, you're effectively out there trying to talk to people's washing machines and tell them, you know, you shouldn't do one more load a day or you should go on strike. It's a machine and people can use it and benefit from it. And if you don't want to use it, you're only hurting yourself. So um, it's, it's sad that a lot of these people, they, you know, they get stuck in the world of Bitcoin from the fact that they see a bunch of people on Twitter or on Reddit or on the internet or on TV talking about Bitcoin with enthusiastically. And they just they switch on their negative defensiveness and it challenges their state, uh, their status programming, and they just become hostile to it. And it's, it's sad that um, we're, you know, we're seeing, it, it, it's really the Luddites, you know, there was a point in the industrial revolution when um, um, Peasants would organize uh, times at night where they'd meet up and go to factories and uh, destroy the factories because they were worried that machines are going to take their jobs. And this was a serious problem in England for a certain point in time. And really, the no coiners are going to be remembered like that. Like there was when we, when we first invented what in a few hundred years I think is going to be known as money. You know, the word Bitcoin is going to be money, and effectively everything else was going to be crappy shit we used. <laughs> <laughs> as a substitute for money before we managed to actually build proper money. There's going to be a little footnote in history, just like we spoke about the Luddites right now. There's going to be people, you know, talking and joking about, there was a point in time when we first invented the grand machine of money, where a bunch of people thought that they could talk this thing down. And they were pretty angry at it and they were shouting at it and they thought, no, this thing can't work, won't work. And it's uh, too volatile. It's going to go to zero. And really, it's it, it, it's amazing. The more that you think about Bitcoin, the more time you spend about Bitcoin, uh, thinking about Bitcoin, the more you realize just how much of a machine it is. The more completely idiotic most <laughs> no coiner discussion of Bitcoin begins to sound like. 
what are you people talking about? Why why do you think your opinions matter? In in you know, like today Steve Hankey was going on about um how something is wrong in El Salvador and how um he's he's talking about um, in Lebanon how the only place the only thing that can fix Lebanon is a currency board. And at the same time he thinks Bitcoin is a stupid idea. And it's amazing. Like People in Lebanon can't get a currency board because in order for them to get a currency board, you need the same criminals who are in charge to give up power and hand over power and hand over the money printer and all of their resources, all the, their ability to continue to finance themselves and their militias and their support bases. You're telling them, excuse me, sir, please hand me all of your wealth and power while I give it to a committee of uh, seven people who are going to just um, run a dollar stable coin. You know, Hank has been trying to make that happen in Lebanon for quite a while. And his currency board idea has gotten exactly zero liquidity. Exactly. There has not been a single uh, Satoshi that went into his currency board stable coin in Lebanon. It hasn't started operating. There's no prospect of it operating. Nobody wants to do it. And it's just not happening. And um, it's happened. He's done it in like, what, three countries or something like that in his life. He, uh, to give him credit, you know, he did fix hyperinflation in a couple of uh, post-Soviet countries. But, um, you know, that was a kind of unique situation where people knew they didn't want inflation, but, you know, they were so... Uh, traumatized by years of socialism that they didn't know how to run a free market uh, or a relatively stable currency. But um, there's not a lot of popularity and a lot of popular uptake for uh, central banks and governments handing over the reins of power to uh, Steve Hanke and his friends. On the other hand, Bitcoin liquidity continues to grow in Lebanon. Lebanese people continue to buy more Bitcoin and they have more Bitcoin today than they did a year ago and much more than they did five years ago. And it continues to grow. So Lira liquidity, you know, the local shitcoins liquidity is declining while dollar liquidity and while um, Bitcoin liquidity is rising. And it's hard to estimate how much there is of both. But I ran the numbers a couple of days ago and where currently the score is, you know, two years ago is when uh, troubles started in Lebanon. Two years ago, exactly, the lira was still at its pegged price of 1,500 uh, liras per dollar, which it had been at for about 28 years or so. And then two years ago, there was a dollar shortage in the market and the price of the dollar started to rise. It's been two years now, and now the price of the lira is 18, uh, the price of the dollar is 18,000. So we've gone from 1,500 to 18,000 liras per US dollar. So that's a roughly 92% uh, devaluation. Ahmed is here from the front lines of uh, inflation. Am I correct? Are we still at 1,800 or did we hit 20? 18,000 or did we hit 20, Ahmed? Uh, yes, it's around 18,000. 18,000. Okay, so still at 92%. Meanwhile, in those two years, the uh, US um, dollar rate to Bitcoin has gone roughly fivefold up. So it was about $8,000, I think, five years ago. Um, and now here we are at, no, I think it was, wait, I, I, I had the numbers, but I forget. But it, yeah, it was around fourfold, I think. It was fourfold. Yeah, it was uh, so 300% increase in the price of Bitcoin, 92% reduction in the um, um, market value of the lira. So Bitcoin is basically up 50x. So at this point, if two years ago, Bitcoin was worth 2% of the Lebanese lira, you know, the amount of Bitcoin in Lebanon was worth 2% of the Lebanese lira, and people didn't buy or sell any Bitcoin or lira, people didn't add to their Bitcoin positions over the last two years, then we're, um, if it was 2%, then it's now 50%, if you run the numbers on it. So 2% goes up uh, fourfold, and then that one, so that's, a, and then the 98% the, uh, loses 92%, comes out to roughly 
50% each. So there might be as much Bitcoin liquidity in Lebanon today as there is Lira liquidity. And of course, it's only a matter of time. It may have happened, but it's only a matter of time before this happens. There's only one way left for the Lira. It's only going to go down. Um, it won't go up. There's no return for the Lira. From, you know, no currency goes back from 18,000 to 1,000. These things don't work that way. There's only, and then of course, you know, if you look at it politically, there's absolutely no chance whatsoever that there's any kind of political reform coming in any uh, shape or form. They're running the money printers like crazy. The money supply has gone up sevenfold in the last uh, two years. It's gone up sevenfold. It was at five uh, uh, trillion liras, I think, or something like that. And now it's up to 35. There's a lot of zeros uh, when you're dealing with the lira, and I forget, but it's up fivefold, whatever uh, order of magnitude it is. And that's the physical money. They're literally just out there printing cash and handing it out to government employees. And um, there's no sign that this is going to stop. So it's just continue, going to continue to decline. On the other hand, uh, the dollar and uh, is it, it, doing much better, but not that much better. It's still also number go up. The wrong number goes up. The supply is always constantly going up. Whereas Bitcoin, <laughs> the supply is only increasing at 1% or 2%. So there's th this is a one-way street that we all know where this is going. It may take another year. It may, it may already have happened. It may take another 10 years. But the amount of Bitcoin liquidity in Lebanon is going to be larger than the amount of uh, Lira liquidity in Lebanon at some point. And Lebanon is one exception, one, one example now, but that's just going to continue, I think, eventually. I don't see a reason why it will stop. It will happen in Lebanon and it will happen in many other countries. And this machine just continues to grow. You know, <laughs> washing machines continue to get adopted. People continue to import and build and export and buy all of these washing machines because they're useful. They help them uh, save on time. And that's, that's, I think, the technological reality people need to come to terms with. Like they need to just separate the fact of whether it's an, uh, uh, what their opinion is, what their textbook says. Mm -hmm. This is a machine. Think about it as a money vending machine that exists in every corner of earth. Anybody can buy it anywhere. There's a money vending machine where you can put in all of your local shit coins and get hard money out. You may not like how it works. You may have very strong ideas about the design parameters, about the user experience. Nobody gives a fuck. Doesn't matter. Go build a better product, make Bitcoin easier, tell people if you have something productive to say, but at this point, it's you're the weird guy who tried to convince people to stop using washing machines and because the washing machines are mean. Uh, you're the weird guy who tried to stop the, the tried to stop the you know the the, the, the um, uh, textile machines and tried to break them because you thought they're going to be bad for humanity. It's just the machine. Separate your emotions from it. It's a machine and people will use it because it works, because it serves them. Now, try and learn some humility and, humility and understand why it helps them, why it serves them. Why it is it that your currency board has not reached the level of adoption that Bitcoin has reached at this point, which has exceeded probably, possibly exceeded the local uh, currency and may well exceed it. Uh, in, in the next few years. Why is it that all over the world, Bitcoin is running at around 600, trillion, $600 billion of market capitalization, whereas your currency boards have, what is it, two uh, small Eastern European countries or three small Eastern European countries that have adopted this many, many years ago? That's the way to start thinking about machines. You know, Why is it that everybody in the neighborhood is getting a washing machine? because they can now afford to learn to read because they don't have time, that they finally have time to read because they don't have to wash their own clothes. Think about it, wouldn't reading be nice? Wouldn't having some savings be nice? It's amazing, these people don't see it and it's, it's only going to get funnier and I'm here for it. I'm here to make fun of them every week on this podcast, on Twitter, day in, day out, 
and it's it's for their own good. Eventually, they're going to see it. And I think the earlier they um, get exposed to the idea that they're being complete fucking idiots, the earlier they snap out of it. So it's for their own good. Don't you think, Safe, that it's kind of a, it's really an adolescent point of view because when you're in adolescence, you just, most people anyway, are, are terrified of peer pressure and they're just going to go with what you were starting out this whole most recent rant kind of saying is that people will listen to what other people are saying and just kind of model the, their behavior, their thoughts on that, right? And that's a very adolescent kind of point of view. And that's how most, I think, people function. They're not really uh, forward thinking. That's just the, way the human race seems to be. I have a question for you about um, stock to flow model. And if you feel that it correlates or see that it correlates, how, how you think it correlates through this time of maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe this time could have been predicted or was by some people, but by this time of lockdowns and, um, you know, economic breakdown and everything, how do you see that model correlating with these times? I think it's pretty incredible uh, that it's still pretty much holding on. Like it's, um, if you look at it, at the, um, let me dig it up. If you look at the uh, the error margin at the, at the standard deviations, the, um, the predicted price has not been out of the one standard deviation for pretty much seven years, I think. It was January 2014. Yeah, January 2014 was, or maybe February 2014 was the last time that it was at the top of the, uh, it was outside the two standard deviation models, two standard deviations uh, error uh, margin, which is pretty incredible because um, what a model really says is that it has a 76, 67% confidence in the one standard deviation range. So that's a dark blue bland. If you're listening to this, go to S2F multiple on Twitter at S2F multiple and check out the uh, Bitcoin daily stock to flow and price chart. So you see there's the uh, price, which is prediction, which is the black line. And then there's the dark blue uh, error, a uh, dark blue one standard deviation and the light blue two standard deviations. So we've been, outside the one standard deviation um, for the last few weeks, and we were outside it for a few months longer than now during 2018 and 2019. We spent a few months there. and uh, But the last time it was outside of the two standard deviation was in January 2014. And the two standard deviation uh, confidence interval is a 95% confidence interval. So this, what this model is saying is that it has 95% confidence that the price is going to be between the narrow, between the, in, in the range of the uh, light blue and 67% confidence that it's going to be in the dark blue. And it's so far been massively outperforming it because it's spent far more than 67% in the one standard deviation range and it's spent uh, far more than 95% in the one standard, in, in the two standard deviation range, uh, 95%. So, uh, you know, what this is really saying is that think about all the stuff that has happened in Bitcoin over the last three, four years, you know, um, China banning mining, liquidating half of the hash rate from the network, Elon Musk buying in and then talking shit about Bitcoin, Michael Saylor coming in, the COVID uh, liquidity crisis when there was a big uh, market sell-off. All of that stuff with all of these things, every single one of these things was still within the uh, two standard deviation uh, margin of error. And we've only, and almost always been within the one standard deviation margin of error. So, this is pretty incredible in my mind. And in my mind, you know, before the model is rejected, it'll have to, for it to be rejected, it'll have to spend a significant amount of time outside the two standard deviation range, which means that, you know, the price is going to have to drop under 30,000 30, for several months, or maybe a year, under 30,000, or it's going to have to go above 
300,000 for um, over a year. And that might sound like it's such a large range, but it really isn't because, it, you know, this this model has been holding from a price of under a dollar all the way to a price of $65,000. And so there's always going to be a wide range. And it is a wide range when you look at it now, but it's not that wide of a range, actually, because there's an enormous amount of uh, values under it, under $30,000, where the price could be. And yet, it seems to still be holding to this kind of estimate. And it's kind of suggesting that, you know, wh whatever is happening, whatever is happening in the real world, the dynamics of the market of Bitcoin, because of the set number of Bitcoin, because there's only a fixed number of Bitcoin being made every day, the dynamics of the market are going to trend around it having this range of value based on past performance. You project it forward, you see that it's going to jump up and it's going to go up um, by a certain degree. But um, yeah, it seems it, it seems to still be holding so far. I think it's it's, it's pretty fascinating. So can I just... Yeah. Sorry, Carrie, go yeah. ahead. Car Carrie, Carrie oh, finish. I, I, I was just going to say pretty, I mean, that, that's a, that's a pretty uh, strong case for it when you consider everything you just said, Elon Musk and Michael Saylor and, um, you, you know, the lockdowns, these are pretty dramatic effects, you know? So, uh, I'd say that's a strong case. Yeah. Dan, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, just thinking about it, safe, so trying to pull it all you know, circle back around to where we started this. And we're talking about, um, you know, we, we, we've been on this podcast before talking about the S2F and, uh, you know, the, the, the debates rage far and wide on Twitter. You know, all your models are broken, they're all destroyed and whatever else. And, and um, your classic meme of, uh, of, uh, of uh, looking at praxeology and uh, the S2F model. <laughs> but then, like, bringing it back to an economic... Uh, model that has this this constant, which we've never had before, to, to to look at one of these things, and tying that back to the hash rate that we started talking about. Have we ever seen the S2F model overlap with the difficulty adjustment, and how that has played a part in this whole thing? Because I would love to see that chart just out of interest, and um, you know, backdate that. Have you ever seen anything like that? And what, if not, what what do you what do you envision it might look like? Do you think it would make sense to what we're seeing with the S two F? Or you know, is that the constant? Is that what we're revolving around? Like we 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 began talking about? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm I haven't really seen it plotted with the difficulty, I must say. But um, I think. Um, I, I think basically the, you could see that the, the dynamics of mining might, uh, at least in retrospect, I don't know how, uh, th but this isn't very useful as a predictive tool probably, but in retrospect, you can see, well, it probably is actually, uh, you can see that the times where the model was at the bottom of the one standard deviation range, uh, into the second standard deviation of the range, you know, the uh, light blue area, when the model was around there, these are the times when you have minor capitulation. This is the time when a lot of miners are no longer able to pay their rent uh, because the price of Bitcoin is so low that if they sell a part of their, if they sell Bitcoin to pay for their bills, they won't be able to pay for the rent and the electricity and the staff and all of that stuff that's involved. So, um, when you put it this way, uh, you see that when that happens, that's when the price bottoms basically for a while. And then after that, it shoots up. So that's the point at which the difficulty is uh, adjusting downward. When you get these adjustments in difficulty downward, which happened, say, at the end of 2018, uh, you remember at the end of 2018, there was a big crash. So the price... If you look at it, you know, the price shot up during the bull market, it shot up into the second standard deviation range, and then it crashed and then coiled around the predicted price. The, the model's predicted price was around eight, 9,000. It coiled around it for a while, and then it crashed toward like November 2018. It crashed down to five and 4,000. 
And it spent a few months there, end of 2018, early 2019. It spent a few months at that low range. And during that time, um, that's when a lot of miners got wrecked. That's when a lot of miners had to liquidate. There was a lot of money. Um, a, lo a lot of uh, mining gear was going offline. And as a result, the hash rate was dropping and the difficulty adjustment adjusted downward. But then once these wine miners were wiped out, then uh, miners, miner selling declined and the uh, price began to recover. And we went back to the predicted price, to the black line in the predicted price of the model. So it's, you know, this is investment advice. And again, I, I this model is, uh, it, it is extremely fascinating, but this isn't, uh, this isn't trading advice to go out there and mortgage the house uh, and uh, bet on it. But we're witnessing this kind of dynamic now where miners are having to liquidate. And in this case, it's kind of artificial because it was China that, um, uh, you know, the Chinese ban of mining is what caused this to happen. Um, but it still has the same result, which is that miners have to sell a lot of Bitcoin. And that's causing the difficulty to drop and the price to drop. And um, But I think, you know, when that finishes, um, it's, I, I, it's, it, I, I think we're likely going to see a reversion upward, but we'll see. Um, because I think the the way the dynamic works on the other side of this is that um, when the capitulation of miners happens, they sell a lot of Bitcoin and the price drops but then the difficulty adjusts downward. If you look at it, I was running the numbers uh, earlier today. If you look at mining difficulty right now, it's similar to where it was in September 2019 or in the end of 2019 almost, um, or early 20, uh, uh, late 2019, early 2020, something like that. That's where difficulty is right now. That's where the hash rate roughly is. At that time, the mining reward was uh, double what it is right now, but the price was about a quarter of what it is right now as well, or actually even less than a quarter. Uh, it was like a fifth of what it is now. So that means that the mining rewards at that time, you know, for a specific amount of hash rate at that time, it was uh, not nowhere near as profitable as now. Now is a much more profitable time. So what this means is that a lot of miners um, can hold a lot of their coins. They don't have to sell a lot. And so this is kind of the uh, spur of the recovery, which is that it leads to a lot of profitability for miners, so miners don't have to sell. So then the earlier um, oversupply in the market where miners were selling too much is now countered by mine after those miners are wiped out and they capitulate and they're no longer selling then the remaining miners are selling less and because they're selling less that causes more of a uh, spike upwards so i think w we could perhaps see that maybe we will maybe we won't but um you know the the model in order for it to stay uh interesting for me uh it's 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 already done incredibly at in order to situate yourself in a place where it's situate the price situate the current price in a place where whatever happens it's going to do or stay in that range it's hard to see it dropping significantly under 30,000 for a very long time i think perhaps I could be wrong but you could see why that might not happen because um, you know it seems that there's a lot of um, there's, there's there's a lot of demand to be able to keep buying up new coins at this price. But, you know, funnily, just uh, one interesting uh, tidbit is it was only what was it uh, three months ago when the model was going to get invalidated on the upside, and now it's getting invalidated on the downside. The fact that it can get invalidated on the upside and on the upside. On the upside and the downside within the space of three months is, I think, the biggest testament to how well it's been performing. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And like did these theories, what 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 are your what are your thoughts around these theories that China did this and are currently loading up 
on Bitcoin. And the reason they did that was to tank the price so that it could get Bitcoin at a lower price and uh, are currently loading up on it. And if you play this out in a year's time, they could do the absolute reverse, right? They could turn around and say, right, you can all come back and we will guarantee you two, three, four years, whatever it is, free energy because they literally could do that. Everybody settled back in the US now, wherever else they've gone, and the same thing would happen. They would all go offline. They would chase the zero cost. China could even turn around and say, we will even rehouse. We will give you free, like they could do anything. What would happen? The price would tank, right? Because the miners would go offline. Then they could just carry on buying up at lower prices again. Am I thinking crazy shit here? Or, you know, is this some kind of, I mean, it's great for Bitcoin in the long run because... Yeah, every- I think that the, the hole in that theory is that if China says, hey, miners can come and have free Bitcoin, that's not going to cause the price to tank because the miners are, that are in the US, if they, you know, hypothetically this happens, they're going to move to uh, China. They're not going to be liquidated and broke. They're going to be um, making money because of the fact they're going to go to a place that's so cheap that is compelling. So... They won't be needing, if they had to sell a lot of Bitcoin, they wouldn't do it. So I don't really think this is, um, like when you think about all of these kind of games, whether they're trying to manipulate, if, if you try to justify it from the sense of they're trying to manipulate this in order to um, make more Bitcoin, you quickly realize that if they thought about this seriously, they would, uh, they would just stack as many stats as they can and they wouldn't play these stupid games. Like, really, it's much easier to just, uh, you know, if they wanted to stack sats, they would have taxed the miners in sats. You know, they would have just said, all right, you shut down or we get to supervise every single block and every single hash and we get a cut. You know, we get 20% of all the hashes. Uh, I think if they wanted more Bitcoin, this would have been far more profitable. And of course, the miners would have preferred to do this than to move. Um, and they could have stacked a lot of sats. But no, I think they just decided to no coin. It was a premeditated decision to no coin. And it was all captured in the hash rate anyway. To bring it back. Yeah. Right. 60% drop in hash rate. Water off a duck's back. Off a duck's back. It's not lost on me your, your washing machine um, analogy either to, to use uh, Bitcoin as the washing machine for dirty fiat into uh, the most clean <laughs> asset we've ever had. But can I, because you, this is something I've been thinking about. You were talking about the midwits and the Luddites and, and whatever else. And it just constantly fascinates me that, uh, that these guys, you know, that they carry on the way they carry on. At what point do you, during uh, Econ 101 or a macroeconomic PhD course, you know, whatever, did, did they teach the sunk cost fallacy? Did I leave that to like the last semester? You know, th- th- is that the irony? Because like th- these guys now, you know, that's, that's what's going on, right? If they're 40, 50, 60 years of age, the sunk cost fallacy of facing up to a whole career term of lies and uh, shadowy behavior and shady behavior, they, they can't face this truth of what's facing them. So I, I would love to know, uh, at what point does that, get, does that get taught? It rarely gets mentioned. The sunk cost fallacy is... Um, not mentioned all that much. Uh, opportunity cost, of course, is the one that is the real glaring omission right there. I mean, they do mention it, they do calculate, but um, if you, re- you know, if, if they really thought opportunity cost in college, everybody would drop out. Everybody who takes economics would drop out. It, it it's not a sustainable business model to <laughs> bring people into class, charge them money in order to tell them why they shouldn't have paid you money. <laughs> should have used their time more wisely. Um, so it doesn't get a lot of play. And in fa- instead, um, yeah, economics is just a bunch of math. Essentially, fiat science devolves into just um, 
formalist math that means nothing, but you know, you're know you out there and you're proving that you can do the math and you can solve the equations and that's it. And uh, just uh, political uh, posturing, basically. Uh, you know, poor people shouldn't be poor and uh, we should uh, give people jobs and people who work should get paid more. And just kind of like kindergarten uh, make a wish uh, hour where everybody sits around and talks about well, how they would like to see the world. Um, that's that's what it is, basically. Save, can I ask a basic question? Sure. Um, how do you personally define money? How do I want? How do you personally define money? I go with Mises and Rothbard on this. Uh, money is a generalized medium of exchange. Anything can be a medium of exchange. Money is a generalized medium of exchange. There's no uh, clear definition, the clear objective definition of what constitutes a money. In, well, because generalized is a relative and subjective term. Uh, but medium of exchange has a precise definition. Medium of exchange is something that you buy with the intention of buying it. It's this things from an investment. You know, you, an investment yields uh, returns. And um, a consumption good is something that you buy because you want it for its own sake. But a medium of exchange is something that you buy purely in order to uh, exchange later on for something else. So that's what a medium of exchange is. Now, among these media of exchange, a uh, few will, uh, very few will be uh, money will be general media of exchange. Correct. All right. Well, we're running over time for today. Um, it's uh, it's getting a little bit late over here. Uh, anybody else have anything else they want to talk about? One last question, say. Yeah. One last question. Yep. Is it coming home? Looks like it. I don't know. <laughs> England's going to win a tournament. <laughs> Come on. You know it. You know it to be true. I know. I mean, Liverpool won the league, so maybe even England will win. <laughs> <laughs> I, will come, I want an insightful, safer Dean answer. Is it coming home? You know, I have to admit, this is the first international tournament that I haven't been able to watch regularly since 1988. Since the European Championship of 1988, I've watched every tournament, uh, but not this one. Having said that, I mean, I think, yeah, it's just uh, the French were strong favorites, in my opinion, but they messed it up. That they they, uh, they have too many egos in the squad and it didn't work out. Um, and the Spanish don't look too good. The Italians, the Italians look good, but the, they don't have as much. Uh, it's um, they they don't have as much uh, big game quality as the English do. Like the English have a lot of players who've played Champions League finals and Champions League later rounds more than the Italians, I think. So it seems they have more experience may be able to pull it off better. Uh, but you still can't write off the Danes. Home advantage, both games. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, you know, it's amazing. Now they're going to let 60,000 people pile into Wembley and then still uh, go back to lockdown. It's incredible. Just because, probably because UEFA told them, you know what, we'll go move it somewhere with fans. And they said, no, 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 it's okay. We can get 60,000 people into a stadium, but then we'll go back to locking them like cattle. It's so sad. Absolutely. All right, mate. Thanks. Great rip. All right. I'll see you guys uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, Wednesday. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. See you, everyone.